Good morning. Hi, my name is Ben Selby, and I am 10 years old and I am in the fifth grade at Eden Elementary School. I am so glad to be here this morning to welcome you to Children's Sabbath. First of all, I wanted to start our morning off with a joke or two. Did you know I was a comedian? I am, and maybe even better than Pastor David. Just kidding, Pastor David. See, I already made you laugh. What type of car would Jesus would have driven? Have driven? I don't know what kind. A Chrysler. <laughs> <laughs> what animal can Noah not trust? I don't know what kind. The cheetah. <laughs> okay, now for the announcements. There will be free. There will be a free shot event this week, with this Wednesday from 8 to 11 a.m. here at the church. Bring all your paper documents to be disposed of in a safe way. Our next STARS luncheon is also this Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Sign up on the Deep Roots Bulletin Board. Lastly, the Sir non Shaken Adult Social for the 30s to 50s Club, my mom and dad's age, will be Thursday, May 18th, the RSVP. Deadline this weekend is this person, so please don't see the bulletin insert on how to how to RSVP. Do don't forget to book those babies, those sitters. That's all I have today. Enjoy the service and thank you. I invite you now to join with me for the unison opening prayer. The words will appear on the screen, and I invite you to pray along with me. Let us pray. Lord of life, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted on a cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restored to humanity all that we had lost through sin. Throughout these 50 days of Easter, we proclaim the marvelous mystery of your death and resurrection. For all praise is yours, now and forever. Amen.
Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane, and I'm glad to be able to be with you today on The Vine, our online campus at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And today has been a really special day as we've celebrated Children's Sabbath. And it's been wonderful having these kids uh, lead us in worship throughout the day. Our scripture is a familiar one about children. It comes from the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it's to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us anew this day. And Lord, that we would not only hear your word, but that we would heed your word and live by it throughout our days. In Jesus' name, amen. There's this famous scene in the movie Pretty Woman, starring Julia Roberts, where her character goes clothes shopping on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. If you've never seen the movie, it's a modern retelling of the Cinderella story, but that does not make it appropriate for young children. If you have seen the movie, then you know exactly the scene that I'm talking about. Vivian, played by Roberts, has been given plenty of money to go spend on clothes, but the sales clerks at the upscale clothing stores take one look at her wild hair and her shabby dress, and they refuse to help her. So Vivian goes back to the hotel where she's staying, and she cries to the manager that she's supposed to buy a dress for an upcoming dinner, and she has all this money, but no one will help her. The nice hotel manager then makes arrangements for her to go shopping at the store of a friend, and she gets what she needs there. Then with her new dress on, her hair pulled back, a fancy hat, fancy shoes, and bags and bags of more clothes, she goes back to the first shop and tells the clerk that ignored her, Hi, do you remember me? I was in here yesterday. You wouldn't wait on me. You work on commission, right? Big mistake. Big. Huge. And as she leaves, she says, I have to go shopping now. Obviously, Vivian was making the point that the clerks at the upscale shop should have taken her more seriously. Christ's disciples were about to do the same thing on their way to Jerusalem. No, they weren't about to miss out on a huge commission, but they were about to ignore some really important people. Busy, pushed, stressed out about so many truly urgent things, they were suddenly intruded upon by some mothers who requested that their children get to meet Jesus. Children, the disciples answered, we don't have time for children. There are sick folks to heal and lessons to teach and Pharisees to challenge and temples to cleanse and thrones to establish. Don't bother the teacher with children. And as the rejected mothers were about to turn away, Jesus realized what had taken place. And the author Mark says, when Jesus saw what had happened, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such as these belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall never enter it. And then he took them in his arms and blessed them. The disciples almost turned away the very ones whom Jesus called closest to the kingdom of God. It impresses me on reading the story that Jesus took time to laugh, hug, and play with little kids. We could have included this scene in our Lenten sermon series, for Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He was embarking upon the final episode of his mortal life. Jesus was journeying to the cross. One would think, with all that looming before him, he would have felt that the time for play and laughter was past. But even then, even there, the Savior had time for children. There was something about them that got very close to the heart of Jesus. And there's something about children that ordinarily gets close to the hearts of everyone who follows them. Now, we clergy, we usually do our best to steer clear of cliches. They are weary and worn. Our congregations have heard them all anyway. 
And a lot of them are actually directly opposed to the scriptures. So it's best to avoid them when at all possible. However, when the topic at hand is children, there's no getting around the use of cliches because sometimes they're actually true. Like, children really are our most precious natural resource. Or, the children are our future. Or better yet, children aren't the future, they're the present. According to the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, more than 12,000 children in New Hanover County are food insecure. 12,000 of our neighbors. I spoke with a social worker from New Hanover High School to prepare for this sermon, and she told me that district-wide we have more than 1,000 children right here in our county who do not have permanent housing. Now, that doesn't mean they're sleeping under a bridge, but it's often the case that they're sleeping on someone's couch because they do not have a home of their own. The Center for Homeland Defense and Security keeps a record of all school shootings. When I graduated high school in 1989, there were 19 school shootings in America, which is 19 too many. When my daughter graduated high school last year, there were 302, including one that she witnessed with her very own eyes from just 15 feet away. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death of teenagers in America. Dennis Campbell, the former dean of Duke Divinity School, is unquestionably accurate in his assessment that we are guilty of giving our children too much to live with, but not enough to live for. Our most precious natural resource. And yet, look, look what's happening to them. Maybe those things aren't happening in your home. But does it happen to anyone we know? School shooting at New Hanover did. Your kids and grandkids probably have a bed to sleep in and plenty of food to eat, but that's not necessarily the case with all their classmates. Children need and deserve the very best we have to offer in protection, nurture, education, role modeling, in the allotment of our time, the sharing of our faith, and in the generous provision of our love. Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them. Something about children was close to the heart of the Savior and should be close to the heart of all his disciples. But another important consideration not to miss is that not only do children need us, but we adults also need them. There's a tremendous amount that we mature, sophisticated adults can and should learn from children. The disciples thought they knew all about God and God's word and God's will. But Jesus told them, whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. Or as another translation phrases it, except you believe with the faith of a child, you shall have no part in the kingdom of God. In other words, said Jesus, no matter how skilled or erudite those disciples considered themselves, the children were closer to the truth than they were. They still had a lot to learn from children. That's not really changed that much from Christ's day to ours. For example, we learn about trust from children. There's not one ounce of doubt in a child's mind that mommy has some magical special powers and really can kiss a hurt and make it all go away. That is trust that transcends logic. Absolute confidence in the protective power and unfailing love of a parent. Jesus said that God is enabled to do far more with our lives if we experience that same sort of trust than ever could be done otherwise. You see, doubt builds barriers, but trust opens doors. Except you believe with the faith of a child, you will limit what God can do with your life. Except you trust with the faith of a child. Yes, children also teach us a great deal about faith. A pastor friend of mine posted that during her very hectic Holy Week, her platter was extraordinarily full with church activities. There was a Maundy Thursday service to plan, a Good Friday community service the next day, a sunrise service, and most of all, there was the challenge of getting ready for Easter Sunday with multiple services that would be followed immediately with a family trip to the grandparents. 
all throughout the week. She kept talking about Easter plans and Easter services, Easter this and Easter that. And then one evening at dinner, it was her five-year-old son's turn to say a grace. And at the end of his God is great, God is good prayer, he added the words, and I sure hope Jesus is feeling better. She asked her husband what in the world he was talking about. He didn't know, so she asked her son. He told her that his Sunday school teacher had been telling them about the cross and how Jesus suffered there for us. So he prayed, aware of the suffering of Christ, while she, a theologically trained pastor during Holy Week, had mentally jumped right past the suffering and was concerned only with preparing for the victory celebration. A lot of us do that, don't we? Children teach us great lessons about faith, especially, I suspect, because they get to the heart of the matter. Children, more than anyone, seem to understand intuitively that at the heart of Christianity is Jesus, his life, his death, and his relationship with us. Additionally, children share powerful secrets about how we're meant to deal with one another. For example, I grew up in an all-white neighborhood. And like many of you, I went to an intentionally integrated school due to carefully drawn district maps and busing. I remember my elementary school days back in the 1970s. Everyone just played with everyone on the playground. When it was time to play Red Rover, which is too dangerous to play nowadays, you didn't care if the people you were playing with were African American, Asian American, Hispanic, white, or Native American. When you played dodgeball, which has also been considered too dangerous to play in the 21st century. We didn't care what color you were, we just played. And when you got on top of one of those geodesic dome jungle gyms that no longer exist because they too are, yes, also too dangerous, you just had fun. We were kids. We didn't realize the color of one's skin made any difference. We thought people were neat just because they were people. We were children, and as such, we were colorblind. Children almost always are, unless somebody teaches them not to be. Maybe there's a lesson there for us sophisticated grown-ups, a lesson about who is or who is not worthy of our kindness and care. Maybe children know better than anyone else that it's not the color of their skin or their gender or the size of their home or one's political affiliation or the kind of car that one drives that makes a person worthy and special. Children seem to understand that everyone's worthy just because God made them. That's enough. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, said Jesus. For to such as these belong the kingdom of God. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a child shall not enter it. Years ago I heard someone quote the following poem and I've found it again, but I uh, can't figure out who wrote it, but whoever the author may have been obviously comprehended the Christ-likeness of children. The author obviously understood that to be like Jesus, we must somehow become like children again. Here's how it goes. There's something quite nice about children. Every family should have one or two. They're such a fine race when they're kept in their place, say the playground, the park, or the zoo. In his place, a child's quite delightful, full of fun, a most interesting buddy. But his yearning for action can cause a distraction when he has invaded the study. The office is no place for children. They foul up our work with their fun. So we make it a rule that they must go to school so their elders can get something done. Some children came searching for Jesus. His friends were distressed and inclined to think, oh, how terrible to have a fresh parable suddenly slip from his mind. So they tried to get rid of the children, surely no major disgrace, protecting their master from certain disaster by keeping the children in place. Let the children come in, shouted Jesus. They said something frightfully odd. They are bearers of grace, and their ultimate place is right smack in the kingdom of God. Well, the place of a child is the kingdom that's what Jesus carefully taught. So the last time you did play some ball with your kid, you were closer to God than you thought. Amen. Let's pray.
Holy God, I thank you for the children. We were all kids at one point. And Lord, as we've grown up, we've had our, our ups and downs. But we look around and we see these innocent faces all around us. And we just ask that they might keep their innocence a little bit longer. Lord, I pray that you would protect them and that we as a society do our best to surround them with a community of love and forgiveness, shielding them from harm whenever we can. Lord, help us to pour ourselves into the generations that follow so that their world and their lives will be just a little bit better than ours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think whether you've got children at home or not, it's time for us all to look around and see what kind of difference we can make for the next generation. To take away the hurt and the pain and instead bring joy and laughter. Let kids be kids. But also I pray that we might trust our Heavenly Father like the children trust us and that we would enter into His kingdom knowing that God is with us and wants the best for us. Let's go forth in faith to live out that faith. In Jesus' name. That be I